Welcome back to LLT 180, The Heroic Quest, in which we take up the very end of Kurt Vonnegut's novel, Breakfast of Champions, and with it, the end of this um, class for this semester. When last we left off, Kurt Vonnegut, author of the novel, Breakfast of Champions, is waiting in the Midland City Holiday Inn sitting around, having a drink, smoking a cigarette, and waiting for the two protagonists of his novel, Kilgore Trout and Dwayne Hoover, to come into contact. In previous incarnations of various scholarly works, I have tried to point out that the conflict between Dwayne Hoover and Kilgore Trout is exactly parallel to the, con to the contact, the fight, between Gilgamesh and Enkidu in the Gilgamesh epic. Like <clears throat> Gilgamesh, Dwayne Hoover is practically the king of Midland City. He's rich, fantastically well-to-do. Everybody loves him. Just like Gilgamesh. Well, everybody doesn't love Gilgamesh, but he's rich and powerful, and that should count for something. The um, Enkidu role the wild man, the crazy guy, is played by Kilgore Trout, who lives in the basement installing aluminum windows, wishes he were dead, writes short stories that nobody reads, that only show up in porn mags. As a result of Gilgamesh and Enkidu's conflict, Enkidu's life, but particularly Gilgamesh's life, becomes very, very different. The same thing will happen in Breakfast of Champions. Kilgore Trout and Dwayne Hoover will come into contact with each other, they will get into a fight, and their lives will be different forevermore. The difference is, Kurt Vonnegut Jr. is sitting in the hotel lounge, drinking, a, having a drink and a cigarette while he's watching his two fictional characters come, at, come into conflict. <clears throat> like, like everybody else, in the course of this class, it seems. Gilgamesh is just looking for answers. Odysseus goes to the underworld. He's looking for an answer. Um, Dionysus goes down to the underworld to find a decent epic poet, po I'm sorry, tragic poet that can help the Athenians out. Um, Cupid and Psyche um, is again, you know, just looking for an answer to the question of how can you live a happy life? Antigone asks, what's the answer to leading, what's the relationship between loyalty to the state and loyalty to some higher law? Everybody's looking for answers. Dwayne Hoover is looking for an answer. Dwayne Hoover comes in to the Holiday Inn Lounge. Um, he's nuts. So am I. He come, and he um, wants to know the answer, the answer, the answer, the answer. He comes up to Kilgore Trout, the featured speaker at this Festival for the Arts, and he digs his chin into Kilgore Trout's shoulder. And I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you. It's very annoying. Asking for the answer, the answer, the answer. Um, it is absolute despair of anything better to do, he hands him a book. The book is called Now It Can Be Told. I don't remember whether I mentioned it in the previous lecture because that was two years ago, but basically the premise of Now It Can Be Told, and that would make a fine identification question on your test, kids. The premise of Now It Can Be Told is the creator of the universe is telling the reader of the novel, you are the only creature in the world that has free will. Even I don't have free will. Everything is a machine, everything is a robot except for you. How do you like that? Everything else is a machine. I am a fat, bald, BS spouting machine in a maroon shirt. For example, police men bust people because they are speeder buster machine and so on and so forth. Dwayne reads through all of this stuff almost instantly because Vonnegut thoughtfully writes down that he had taken speed reading lessons. 
and he immediately loses it. Dwayne Hoover reads the novel, Now It Can Be Told, in about two minutes, and becomes convinced that everything is a machine, a swimming machine, a piano playing machine, a whatever machine. He beats the crap out of his gay son, Bunny Hoover, the pianist, and calls him a bleep bleeping machine. He punches a woman in the face for being a swimming machine. And he runs out of the lounge and over to the Pontiac dealership to start wailing the tar out of Francine Pefko, his mistress, his secretary, on the grounds that she is a sex machine that, well, you wind her up, she has sex with you, and then she'll tell you about a Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise. Here's where the novel gets really strange. I mean, I mean, it's really strange already. But I mean, here's where it gets really strange because Kilgore Trout, who has spent the entire book thinking hateful thoughts about the human race, thinking life is pointless, thinking that he's writing these things just to amuse himself, Kilgore Trout sees Gilgamesh, I bet <laughs> there's a Freudian slip, Kilgore Trout sees Dwayne Hoover beating the tar out of this helpless woman, Francine Pefko. You will recall, or you'd better, that um, Enkidu is motivated to fight with Gilgamesh for the same reason. Enkidu gets word that Gilgamesh is always the first one to sleep with the bride regardless. Enkidu won't put up with this. This is really mean to the ladies. I'm going to fight this Gilgamesh. Same thing here. Kilgore Trout the misanthrope, Kilgore Trout, the guy who thinks life has no purpose, sees Dwayne Hoover beating up a helpless woman, and he wades in to pull her off. And he does. He manages to save Francine Pefko from Dwayne Hoover beating the tar out of her, but he gets hit the top joint of his index finger bitten off. This is the fight. Vonnegut doesn't tell us the rest. But Vonnegut says that eventually Dwayne Hoover beat up so many people that they had to bring in a, um, port a um, mobile ambulance to take care of everybody. So that Kilgore Trout himself had to go to the hospital because he had had the um, tip of his right ring finger bitten off. And it is in the hospital, I submit that Kilgore Trout finally experienced his own, his own formal catabasis. Because Dwayne Hoover has bitten his finger off, he has to go to the hospital. He has to go to the emergency room. He gets his finger taken care of, but he winds up down in the basement. If ever anybody watching this has ever been in a hospital, especially a hospital basement, you will know what I'm talking about. You will know what Kurt Vonnegut is writing about. Because it's down in the basement that they keep the guts of the hospital, the things that you really don't want to see if you're being treated in a hospital. Kurt Vonnegut says that Kilgore Trout walked by an x-ray room. That's what they had back in the 70s. And he immediately started to wonder himself whether he had anything bad growing inside of him. Kilgore Trout is starting to have human feelings. Vonnegut points out millions of people have mooned about the same thing. He walks past what looks like a great big huge refrigerator or freezer, walk-in freezer, but in fact it's the morgue. That's where they keep the morgue people, die in hospitals. Kilgore Trout starts to think, I'm not going to live forever. Kilgore Trout emerges from the basement of the hospital with a much better sense of his own humanity. But he really still doesn't know what he's going to do next. Paradigm for life. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Well, now what am I going to do? What's the answer? He has no answers. <clears throat> Kilgore Trout walks to the center of the arts assuming that he is going to have to give his talk and earn his $1,000 honorarium. 
He starts walking slowly over. He doesn't know that the entire festival has been canceled thanks to Dwayne Hoover. He's just doing what he has to do because he has no choice. On his way there, he is accosted, he is met, by a 50-something guy standing outside of a 1972 Plymouth Duster smoking a cigarette who wants to talk to him. Mr. Trout! Mr. Trout! The guy standing next to the 1972 Duster with a Paul Mole in his mouth is Kurt Vonnegut himself. Kurt Vonnegut writes himself into the novel. Kurt Vonnegut writes himself into the novel to tell Kilgore Trout, hey, Kilgore Trout, Mr. Trout, Mr. Trout, um, I'm your creator. You are a character in a novel I'm writing. And today, as of today, Mr. Trout, you are free. Everybody else is going to go on being what they are, being what I wrote them to be. You are free. Now, we've been paying attention all of this time. This is pretty much the premise of Now It Can Be Told. Okay, you people watching this, all except for you. That's right, you, you. Everybody else I've created, but you. Vonnegut, the more Vonnegut tries to convince Kilgore Trout, yeah, I, can, I created you, Mr. Trout, um, the more Trout resists. At one point, Vonnegut even asks Trout, you know, if I had met the creator of the universe, I would certainly have some questions. Do you have any questions? And Trout says, yeah. Do you have a gun? <laughs> Vonnegut proves to Kilgore Trout that he is Kilgore Trout's creator. He sends him to the surface of the sun where he cannot burn. He sends him to the Taj Mahal and Dar es Salaam. And he sends him to Indianapolis, Indiana, circa 1922, just to prove that he, Vonnegut, is the creator of the universe and poor Trout is just an ignorant schlug. This, too, is reminiscent of how cruelly Mr. and Mrs. Utnapishtim point out to Gilgamesh that he is, in fact, mortal. You'll recall that at the very end of the Gilgamesh epic, the very end of the Gilgamesh epic, Mr. and Mrs. Utnapishtim promise Gilgamesh immortality if he can stay awake for seven days and seven nights. Gilgamesh falls asleep immediately. He wakes up to seven different loaves of bread in various stages of decay, signifying to him that, yeah, Gil, you're going to get old, you're going to die, and that's how it's going to be. Vonnegut isn't much nicer. He brings Trout back before him. Trout is completely broken. What do you want with me? He's kind of whimpering. He says, listen, I've arranged a number of things for you, Mr. Trout. You are um, no more pornographic publishers. I've gotten you a good publisher. Moreover, you are going to win a Nobel Peace Prize for, a Nobel Prize, I should say, for medicine. Because you will become a crusader in the field of mental health. You will be a, um, a tireless speaker combating the notion that bad ideas can cause bad results. Is there anything more you wish from me? And Kurt Vonnegut prefers to somersault into the void, skipping backwards into time as he usually dematerializes at the end of an novel. He's making all that crap up. And all he can hear in the background is Kilgore Trout saying, make me young, make me young, make me young. I believe you don't have to, that this conclusion is not accidental. Granted, Vonnegut himself gave this novel a C plus. But you'll recall that once Gilgamesh found out that he could not be immortal, his next immediate wish is to become young again. It's a perfectly normal wish, as I was commenting to my friend and videographer, Rich, at the beginning of this taping session. My own self-image of my own bad self is with somebody with, you know, complete head of hair, more or less, you know, a big, huge red beard, and much, much thinner. What happened to me? I mean, 
I don't actually want to be 27 again, but I wouldn't mind looking like I'm 27 again. I could deal with that. It's a typical wish. You're not going to live forever. Seize the day as best you can. And the best way to seize the day? Be young. I get that. At the end of the Gilgamesh epic, another thing that happens once Gilgamesh loses his opportunity with, to grab the plant that will make him young again, he starts weeping. The last page of Breakfast of Champions is a picture of Kurt Vonnegut, a self-drawn picture by Kurt Vonnegut. Basically a nose, a mustache, a mouth, and a big eye with a big tear coming out of it. Vonnegut doesn't really give us any answers in the story Breakfast of Champions, but he does raise the questions in a way that makes you think. Vonnegut is not overly concerned with how best to rule a country. Vonnegut is not overly concerned with what are the public affairs responsibilities of a citizen in the United States of America or any other country. It's almost as if Vonnegut has just run all the way back to the Gilgamesh epic and says, how are we supposed to live? Knowing that Dwayne Hoover didn't have the answer and now he's wearing a canvas camisole. Kilgore Trout doesn't have the right idea, but he's going to try to work towards the right idea and Vonnegut himself just plain doesn't know. I wish I had better answers for you at the end of the semester. But this concludes our reading for the, rest, for the um, Hero and Qu Heroic Quest class this semester. In the next couple of minutes or so, I will try to <clears throat> address themes that may well be on your final exam, because that's what you want to know anyway. By now, if you've made it this far in the class, you have taken the first exam, and you must have done fairly well on it, must have passed, been in passing range or something like that, because you've watched all the way to the end of the lectures and are preparing to take exam number two. I'm not going to speak specifically to what's going to be on your second exam, because frankly, we're going to this is a new class. We're going to have to do some test runs of the exams. If the exams aren't fair at the beginning, I'm going to have to fix them because the course of the recorded lecture isn't going to change. The format of the exam, number two, will be the format of exam number one. You will be pretty much, pretty much responsible for everything we have covered since exam number one. However, it's important to remember, we've covered it last time, Missouri State University still has a public affairs mission. The basic premises of a catabatic journey have not changed. The topography, topology of a catabasis has not changed. You're still going to have to remember all of that. But I'm going to be testing you more specifically on Sophocles' Antigone, Virgil's Aeneid, Dante's Inferno, um, Gogol's Nose, and Vonnegut's Breakfast of Champions. It'll be the same mix of long um, identifications and matching. There will be a short answer question. The short answer question, again, still kind of working on, but it is somehow going to address the relationship of what you have read and listened to this semester to Missouri State's public affairs mission. I believe from my deep knowledge of what has gone on in the other lectures that I am always addressing the public affairs mission, whether you believe me or not, whether you have better ideas than I do, you will have no problem putting together a fairly intelligent essay. Remember, it doesn't have to be right. It has to be your opinion. It has to be well argued about what the public affairs mission really is, about what cultural competence really is. That will be the shorter of the two essays. The longer of the two essays, again, I'm still toying with the nature of what the, finals, what the final essay is going to be, but I would suggest that um, one final essay question, and you'll have a choice. You'll pick this one 
or the one I give afterwards? The first one, the first one is going to be something about the topology or topography of a catabasis. Sophocles' Antigone is a symbolic catabasis. Antigone ventures into the lower guts of the human world. She's been a princess all of her life, and she's being forced to act like a grown woman and a citizen, and she does so. She has her liminal experience when she buries her brother Polynices. She has no guide, sadly enough, but this is obviously a symbolic catabasis. Aeneas literally goes down into the underworld and finds out from his father Anchises not how to live, not how to have a happy life. None of this carpe diem or YOLO stuff. Rather, Aeneas finds out if you don't found Rome, this is what you are denying the world. You'll notice, though, that in, in um, Aeneas' catabasis, there are still lots of details, lakes of fire, you know, rivers of poop, um, people being tortured in all sorts of ways, just like in Aristophanes' frogs, just like in Homer's Odyssey. But where Odysseus, where Odysseus is just trying to figure out how to get home and get a chance to get back with Penelope, Aeneas has to found Rome. It's his mission. Dante in his Inferno builds upon this. Dante's Inferno is such a detailed description of a public affairs -y sort of hell that basically, as I believe I've indicated in previous lectures, that nobody could ever top Dante's Inferno. Nobody could ever make a scarier, more frightening, more complexly meaningful hell than Dante ever could. Parking people in various levels of hell for various reasons known only, you know, explained only by Dante. And you'll notice, too, that Dante is very careful to park Odysseus in a very low level of hell. He's suffering with the lusty people. He's suffering with the gluttons. He's suffering with bad people because Odysseus is a bad person. I think Dante's really big problem with Odysseus. He couldn't put it this way because <clears throat> the public affairs mission was not invented yet. Odysseus is in it for Odysseus. Odysseus wants to get back to Penelope. Yeah, if he is the king of Ithaca, but he doesn't care about Ithaca. He got all of his Ithacan soldiers and sailors killed. He cares about himself. That's it. Which is part of Odysseus's charm, too. Don't get me wrong. But Dante believes that Aeneas is a much more worthy hero. Dante has Virgil as his guide in the underworld. Dante says, you need to be a good citizen. It's not just enough to be culturally competent enough to get your way through life in a happy way. You have to serve the greater good. You have to serve the state. You have to serve other people. Most people fixate on the spiffy pictures of people being tormented in Dante's underworld, but there is a very serious mission here, um, a very serious message here. Dante really was a really heavy-duty public affairs sort of writer. I would say that Dante described hell so thoroughly, so really, that nobody really bothered, no artists really, no writers, no poets ever really bothered to try to match that. Instead, in Gogol's not short story, The Nose, written in the 1830s, in Kurt Vonnegut's novel Breakfast of Champions, written in the 1970s, hell, the underworld, is a symbolic underworld. It goes back to the concept in um, Apuleius' The Golden Ass. Lucius gets turned into an ass and he finds out that hell is the world he lives in. The difference is when he's a young man with money, walk, traveling as he pleases, sleeping with cute looking slave girls, it's a great world. When he's an ass, it's hell. 
Major Kovalyov, the protagonist of Gogol's nose, wakes up, has no nose. And he walks out on Nevsky Prospect, and it's completely different. What was once his main drag, what was once the place where he hung out, the place where he was meant to be, has turned into this perverse hell filled with noses praying at the mother of Kazan Cathedral, um, surly newspaper editors, police chiefs on the take. Hell, Gogol says, is right outside your door. The same thing goes for Kurt Vonnegut in his novel Breakfast of Champions. Vonnegut's Midland City is a thinly disguised variant of his hometown of Indianapolis, Indiana. And he finds plenty of catabatic elements, for example, Sugar Creek. The liminal experience that Kilgore Trout must endure to get into the Holiday Inn. Kilgore Trout looks at this water and he figures he had better take his shoes and socks off before he crosses it, and he does. And when he emerges from Sugar Creek, he finds that his feet are coated in this thin layer of polyester plastic. Granted, it's not as splashy as the river sticks. There's no ferrymen, there's no souls wailing to get in on either end. But Vonnegut, like Gogol, is trying to tell us, if you're looking for hell, walk out the door and look around you. That's going to be one question. Another possibility that I'm entertaining, and we'll try for the um, second essay question. Remember, you only have to prepare for one of them. And keep in mind that the finalized version of the study guide will be up on my website. Is going to be the question of personal happiness, I guess, and good citizenship. We're all looking for answers, and if you are watching this class and taking it for credit, you are very privileged already. You are privileged to be a college student. You are privileged to be a college student at Missouri State University. You are taking this course in hopes that you will acquire a degree from Missouri State University, and with this university degree, you will be able to get a job that is more to your liking, a job that will make you happier, a job that will pay better, and that's all really great. That's what a university is for, that and that's what a university is for. But the fact that you have the opportunity to attend college, the fact that you have the opportunity to put the rest of your life on hold and concentrate yourself to some extent on your studies, you're already a very, very fortunate person. And me, I'm the luckiest of all because I started college in 1978 and I never left. Gilgamesh fights this battle himself between becoming a happy guy, a wild and crazy butt dude like he is at the beginning of his novel, the beginning of his epic, and at the end, trying to figure out how to be a responsible king for the city of Uruk. You will remember that he shares all of his story in all of his detail and put all of its detail and puts it up on the wall of the city of Uruk for those of us who come along to learn from. It's all well and good to follow your passion. It's all well and good to do what you want to do and feel like you are made to do. And that's great. But there's also a matter of finding your proper place. And I respectfully suggest that although much is being taken from you in the way of student loans and tuition, much is still expected of you. I really do seriously believe that you and I and we should all do what we can, engage with the world around us. I know, I know, you can call it engaged citizenship and stuff like that. But I was trying to do this, trying to do this, even before it became a pillar of the Missouri State University Public Affairs mission. And I hope you will consider doing that too. I hope you will, in this essay, talk about Again, Antigone, 
Dante, Aeneas, Major Kovalyov. Well, there's probably not much you can say about him. He's kind of like the parody of the man who doesn't care. And Kilgore Trouton talk about how they try to integrate their own personalities, their own hopes, their own wishes for leading a satisfactory and happy life with that, uh, with the but with the um, obligations, I should say, placed upon all of us by being citizens of a world in which, let's face it, if we're all involved working for a college or attending college, we're pretty well off. Much has been given to us. What are we doing with the gifts that have been given to us? That is going to be the tendency of the second exam. I want to close by apologizing in advance for some of the inconsistencies that exist in this class because, as you may have noticed, there's a 2012 version of yours truly running around in this class, and there's a 2014 version. I'm the 2014 version version on the 2015 version. But I do hope I've given you something to think about. I do hope that I have given you something that you can use in your own real life, realizing that catabasis, yes, it's a literary motif that people write about, but it's something that happens in your everyday life all the time. It's a mechanism for gaining cultural competence, hopefully a mechanism for making you want to be an engaged citizen. We'll leave the ethical leadership part away. The ethical leadership part away. At any rate, I hope it's been fun. I hope it's been real. Thank you for watching this long, and take care. Bye-bye.